today we know in terms of the science, the hard science, is that there are these communication channels between cells in the gut that produce signaling molecules and uh, areas within the brain that respond to these signaling molecules. And we have a pretty detailed understanding of how, this, how these communication channels work. You know, there's some, there's some that are mediated by nerve pathways, mainly the sensory vagus nerve that innervates the gut and uh, that has these little sensors in the gut and responds to signals from many cells in the gut, from hormonal cells, from uh, muscle cells, from other nerves in the gut, but also now from microbes, and then sends the signals back into the brain, brainstem and brain uh, modulating emotional centers within the brain. So that, that's one pathway. Another pathway is that uh, hormonal-like signaling molecules generated by the gut and certain cells in the gut go through the bloodstream again to the brain, brainstem, hypothalamus, and uh, modulate the activity there. And then the third pathway are immune cells. 40% of our uh, entire immune system is located in the gut. These immune cells are respond to uh, things that go on inside the gut. So we have at least three systems that mm -hmm. go from the gut to the brain. And then we have, you know, what's been known for a long time, the so-called autonomic nervous system. So this, these are the, the nerve pathways that go from the brain to the gut and um, they can modulate pretty much every gut function from contractions, transit, peristalsis, secretion, blood flow, immune activity. Um, and um, so when you look at this, it's really a circular communication system. You know, the gut signals to the brain mm -hmm. and the brain signals back to the gut. And it's this circular system that is, um, is, is a, is a nonlinear complex network that generates uh, both gut functions, uh, but also our emotions. So, you know, kind of expanding on that a little bit, can you explain why we have gut feelings or we get butterflies whenever we're maybe feeling nervous or um, concerned about something? So the, the gut sends, uh, the brain sends a lot of nerve signals down into the gut and affects essentially every aspect of gut function. You know, contractions are the things that are most notable to us. So we hear gurgling or mm -hmm. um, growling of the stomach. And um, so that's, you know, con uh, contractions are sort of the easiest understood, but also the same thing happens with secretions, uh, secretions of the pancreas, secretions of the gut cells, mucus, water. Um, you can almost look at the gut as sort of a mirror image of our emotional state in the brain. So every emotion, no matter if we feel it in the gut or not, will have a, a mirror image in gut function. And um, for people that are more sensitive than others, they feel these events going on in the gut and, and they, they have these gut feelings. Um, the butterflies, for example, you know, well-known it's, uh, it's basically related to the arousal of brain circuits, both in positive and negative ways. So when you're nervous, some people get these butterflies, but others, you know, when they fall in love, they get the butterflies. So it's not, it doesn't have a, a good or bad value. It's, a, it's just an arousal of the brain system that tells the gut something special mm -hmm. is, is, is happening. And, um, then there's something else, you know, this, this saying, if you, if you pay attention to it, uh, every day some prominent politician or media person will use that expression, I made this decision based on my gut feelings. Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of more complicated to explain because it's sort of, um, you know, I don't know how much you want to get into this, but um, if you have these experiences uh, throughout your life, from early life on, then when something good happens, something bad happens, something that uh, is, is emotionally arousing, that it doesn't just happen, but our brain also forms a memory of that. 
Um, and these, you know, compared this to uh, like a library of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of video clips that, um, that are encoded as you go through life with the emotional experiences. And later in life, when you make a decision, your brain can access this vast database, just like Google or search engines can access their own databases and make this um, split second decision. So th then this decision is not based on a, on a slow rational plus minus process, but it's, it's instant, just as instant as if you put a, a search term into the Google search engine, mm -hmm. instantly you get an answer, you know? So it's this kind of a thing. Can you talk about different types of feelings and the responses that they might trigger? So sadness or excitement or um, anger, for instance? So when I first got involved in this field in the, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, people have looked at emotional states like anger uh, or anxiety or fear. Um, and there's obviously always limits of how much you can do in the laboratory to induce these emotions. You know, it's not, it's not the real anger that you get being out in real life. It's a, so it's a laboratory condition. But um, it's been shown that they have sort of their unique patterns. So for example, with, um, with anger, you get contractions of your stomach and of your um, uh, sigmoid colon. Mm -hmm. With anxiety, uh, it slows down the stomach, but you still get these high amplitude contractions in the sigmoid colon. With depression, you get a slowing down of contractions, both mm -hmm. the upper part and the lower part. So it seems like each emotion, when you study it in isolation, has its own pattern, which parts of the GI tract it involves. In terms of depression, it's, it's almost synonymous with slow transit and lower bowel peristaltic activity slower digestion um, and, and constipation. You know, for the constipation, it may be different reasons. Maybe some is the slower peristalsis. The other one is the less fluid secretion into the gut. Uh, so pretty several things come together that, that do that. And with anxiety, exactly the opposite. You know, you get overstimulation by the um, autonomic nervous system from the stomach all the way down to the to the end of the, the large intestine. So I'm curious under the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, it's affecting even people who have regular bowel movements and, and just the stress, the anxiety, the grief that we're all feeling during this very wild time that's like very uncontrollable. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, how, how is COVID-19 having an effect on all of this? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a, that, that, that's a good question. Obviously, you know, there's a lot we don't know about COVID-19. Mm -hmm. If you talk about the psychological dimension, it's certainly become clear there's a big psychological dimension to it, particularly for vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's, it's less the, um, so we know from stressors, for example, you know, an earthquake or an acute natural disaster has less of an effect on, on this brain gut interaction as a chronic state has. And um, so in this case, the chronic uncertainty and, um, you know, I, I mean, I think the uncertainty is probably the biggest stress component mm -hmm. in addition to now people losing their, their jobs and their incomes and mm -hmm. uh, which is another, you know, the economic dimension to this. So that's pretty clear. If there's an additional effect of the virus on the GI tract, um, so that's an unanswered question. I mean, you know, in the th about thirty percent of patients, there are GI symptoms, typically mild symptoms: uh, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, bloating, <clears throat> diarrhea. Um, if that is a brain gut phenomenon, as we talked about, that you know, people are worried, um, particularly, you know, if you test positive, obviously all kinds of alarm bells go off in your brain that you, you might end up, you know, going, having to go to the hospital or dying from it. Sure. Um, so my tendency would be, I mean, every, every viral disease has some kind of GI aspect to it, mild. In this case, it could really be the stress, um, 
that's associated with a diagnosis and the anxiety and the worry could be the main reason that these symptoms, these GI symptoms come up. Mm -hmm. So I would not be surprised if that's, you know, that's the case. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are very focused on food and foods that might trigger symptoms. And to me, based on those conversations, it just seems like there is a general lack of awareness in terms of the brain gut interaction and what that, um, the impacts of it um, are on IBS. So Maybe you could talk a little bit about why IBS is now more commonly known as a disorder of the brain-gut interaction. Yeah, so for me, it's been an interesting development. So like, you know, 30 years after that, we um, kept writing articles about the, the, this concept of brain-gut, uh, IBS being a brain-gut disorder and being laughed at at meetings and um, discredited by, you know, by the majority of the field that now all of a sudden it comes as like this great insight that now we know from research. It's, it's sort of really ridiculous in some ways, you know, and um, comes w way too late. So even the people that were adamant um, in pushing this as a peripheral gut disease, a disease of gut function, mm -hmm. um, that even those people now all of a sudden write review articles on the brain gut axis, you know. So it's a very interesting phenomenon mm -hmm. that, um, shows how in academia, how people jump on the bandwagon when, you know, there's things to be gained from it. Um, it's, so you, you started this, this conversation with uh, the food component. So even that is, in my opinion, a big brain gut, uh, has a big brain gut component. Um, and I've seen this in, in many of my patients. And, uh, you know, this has gone through also through various iterations. So early on in, the, in, 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 in this field, um, food was not sort of pushed as a major component um, and was only seen in a minority of patients. Now all of a sudden, you know, the whole focus is on food. Part of these things are driven by the pharmaceutical industry that wants to focus on the gut because that's where their medications work. Um, and then obviously, you know, investigators like they came up with a low FODMAP diet and a, a gluten-free diet. And, um, uh, you know, just thinking about that, uh, 25 years ago, Fiverr was the main treatment, dietary treatment for IBS, which is the opposite of a low FODMAP, FODMAP diet, you know. So it, one thing is important, and I've seen this on many patient uh, experiences, that um, if if you're worried that something, um, to, let me give you, give you a story. So uh, an, an executive who from, works in downtown LA in a, in, a, in a company and had to go out for dinner a lot, for, uh, for lunch a lot, and would have to drive to a restaurant um, somewhere in downtown. Um, that person came to me that he has um, food-related symptom flares. Mm -hmm. In reality, it was the anxiety of going to a restaurant where he doesn't know where the bathroom is um, that triggered, even before he got to the restaurant and, and took the first bite out of his lunch, uh, he got the GI symptoms and felt like he has to go to the restroom. Mm -hmm. uh, when he ate at home, he, he could eat anything. He had no GI symptoms. And I've heard this over and over again, this anticipatory anxiety mm -hmm. about what food could trigger. That's particularly bad, for example, another thing in LA, people that commute to work for anywhere between, you know, 45 and minutes and two hours, when they, um, so many of them don't eat breakfast because they are afraid they're not going to make it to work without having to go to the bathroom. So they could say they avoid breakfast because breakfast triggers their symptoms, but that's not what it is. It's it's the fear of having an uncontrollable bowel movement that, that makes them worried about their, what they eat for uh, breakfast. So this hasn't been sorted out completely. I'm, you know, it's easy to understand uh, like a couple of things we've always known this. So for example, lactose intolerance. 90% of adults in Western countries are lactose intolerant. Mm -hmm. the, that's just a normal, situation. 
as a subset of these patients, particularly who have IBS, so are more sensitive, will have more symptoms when they're lactose intolerant. Mm -hmm. So it's not the lactose, it's this greater sensitivity that an IBS patient has uh, to a milk product. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another one, um, you know, certain, certain vegetables, uh, cruciferous vegetables that are gas producing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you have a hypersensitive gut, if you eat a lot of beans or lentils, mm -hmm. then the, ga the normal gas production from this plant-based food can trigger symptoms of bloating, but that's not really the IBS. It's, you know, um, most people will develop some kind of a bloating sensation when they eat these foods, mm -hmm. but in IBS patients, it's exaggerated uh, because they're more sensitive. So I'm not a fan of these diets that, that you know, have been promoted. Um, and I, I think it's, it's a much better approach with patients to guide them or encourage them to develop their own custom tailored personalized diets, mm -hmm. meaning they eat a healthy diet, you know, which I would say is a largely plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. If they get consistently symptoms from a particular food component, they should eliminate this for a couple of weeks and see if that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't make a difference, the food probably didn't play a role. Mm -hmm. If it did play, a, if it, you know, if it was related to this food item, then either first cut it in half, the amount you eat, or eliminate it. Um, and that typically will lead you to people eliminating milk, dairy products, um, and a, a couple or maximally a handful of um, you know, bean or legumes or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but then they have a personalized diet that they can say that it it empowers them. You know, they selected their own diet. It's theirs. It's different from another IBS patients. I think that process alone to guide them um, and give them empowerment over their or and control over their symptoms is already therapeutic. You know, mm -hmm. rather than saying, "Okay, you go on this diet, and you need a physician who follows you." And uh, I, I think it's just. Uh, yeah, to me, it's always amazing what kind of things come up in this field of, of, of IBS, where it's so easy. I mean, the brain-gut model, or now the brain-gut microbiome model, is really so easy mm -hmm. and can explain so many things, you know, um, and gives us, so in terms of any, you know, brain or mind-targeted therapy, such a incredibly easy and effective uh, way of influencing it. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's the other thing. So you don't need to buy any drugs. You don't need to restrict your your food intake. You know you can just really train your brain to be the normal player in the brain gut in, brain gut interactions. Mm -hmm.